I'm reading the title of this, War Pugs. I'm reading the title. And at the same time I'm reading the title, it's most of the time I know I'm going to hear about something completely far fetched. But this doesn't seem that far off to me, okay? This is about an eggnog riot at West Point. Hooray! Um, so this is the Fat Electrician. If you guys have never seen the Fat Electrician, he is legitimately one of my favorite people to check out right now. Um, like, fatelectrician.com. Get yourself some merch. Most definitely. I have been a fan of this guy ever since you guys turned me on to him. Because, flat out, he talks about stuff the way that I would with a whole bunch of people. Legit, this guy... This is the way that history should be taught to people. The most outlandish stories that I've ever heard have come out of this guy. And it is proof that truth is always stranger than fiction. Um, most of the times that people watch movies about actual legitimate people in history... And the, they try to go as factual as possible. Sometimes you simply couldn't believe them. Deuce Daly. Uh, like like um, Desmond Dawes. Um, uh, pretty much all the people that we've heard about from him. If you saw this in a movie, you wouldn't believe it. You Like, I can't wait for him to do... Like, the Bat Bomb. The Bat Bomb was the first thing I ever uh, checked out from the Fat Electrician. And I still really can't believe it. That they actually went out of their way and did this kind of stuff. But, all that being said, War Pugs, if you haven't subscribed to Fat Electrician yet, please do so. Subscribe to me if you haven't. I'm coming back after losing internet for a week. Oh my god, it sucked. I was losing my mind in here. Let's go, Fat Electrician, and an egg nut ride at West Point. Let's go. ...and tried to kill several of their instructors. Hooray! Today we're talking about one of the greatest military Christmas stories of all time, the Yay. West Point Eggnog Riot of 1820. I still say the best uh, Christmas story of all time was when, you know, George Washington sailed across the Delaware to legitimately light up some people on Christmas. 26. But first, a word from our sponsor. This video is brought to you by the greatest sporting goods store retail location on the planet, Shields. And if you don't live near one, they have an even better online yes, store that's do. got satisfaction guaranteed and price matching. So make sure to go check them out. And then, of course, we have one of our newer sponsors, Permasafe. They are industrial strength. You never know when you're going to need gloves. You never know when you're going to need gloves. And if you're going to get gloves, get some Permasafe. Disposable gloves. You can put like a gallon of water inside these things. They still won't break. That's quality jiggling right there. If you yes. actually work with your hands, you- Jiggle physics, jiggle physics. Game developers pay attention. You need some perma-safe rubber gloves, okay? You're just trying to get 40 hours on your paycheck. You're not trying to go home and give your wife a UTI. Keep your hands clean with perma-safe disposable gloves. Now you're gonna feel some pressure. I mean, back to the video. <laughs> All right, back to West Point, the prestigious military academy was created in 1802. And from 1802 to 1817, it was a complete shit show. It had a terrible reputation for being complete and utter chaos. Pretty much all of the time, cadets were allowed to come and go as they pleased. And then when they did show up, they were too preoccupied drinking or dueling one another to actually learn how to become effective military officers. Cue this man, Colonel Slyvanus Thayer. He's going to be hired as superintendent in 1817, and he's going to turn this ship around. He's okay. going to come up with all kinds of radical rules and because of this he is regarded as the father of West Point and when I say radical rules it was basically just him pointing out obvious shit that we shouldn't be able don't do stupid shit rule number one allowed to do anymore like get drunk all day kill each other in duels and you actually have to show up to class the hardest of these rules to enforce was the no drinking because there was three places to buy alcohol in very close proximity to West Point. They had North Tavern, which was pretty much on West Point. Then you had this little general store type deal ran by a guy by the name of Benny Haven and his wife, Lolita. And then right across the Hudson, you had Martin's Tavern. So Thayer okay. and his war on alcohol buys the building that North Tavern is in, kicks them out and turns it into a hospital. Then he instructs Benny Haven and his wife to no longer sell alcohol to any of the cadets. The only tavern left after that is Martin's Tavern, but that's across the Hudson River, so he just leaves a guard on sentry duty at the dock where the boats are 24-7 to keep any cadets from going over to that tavern, 
That's it. The alcohol problem is solved. Or practical solutions. So they thought, you okay. see, because Benny Haven over here is one of the boys. He was a veteran of the War of 1812, so he keeps selling alcohol under the table, hush hush, to all the cadets. This goes go. on for a couple years, and then Thayer finally catches Benny and his wife selling alcohol, kicks them off the West Point campus, and the rumor is they are the only two people to ever receive a lifetime ban from the military academy. Wow. Now at this point, Benny and his wife have essentially lost their job and their home. Pretty much anybody would be begging for forgiveness and promising not to do it again, but Benny and his wife Laleda are the number one supporting characters in this story because they decide that they're going to buy a fishing shack right on the Hudson River, right outside of West Point, where all the <laughs> cadets can get to it. Benny's new tavern, though, is only accessible from two different routes. You have to either get there by a boat on the Hudson River, or you have to crawl down a 60-foot steep cliffside that has stone stairs carved into it. Okay, so now this, now this goes from a disciplinary action to teaching tactics they should have incorporated this into the tactics they were teaching them if you can get to benny's and get back with some alcohol you pass if you get caught you fail meaning that it is treacherous for pretty much anybody, especially if you're drunk. And whether Benny intended it to be this way or not, this actually discourages pretty much anybody except for a bunch of cadets that are trying to avoid from being caught from drinking at his tavern. So his tavern is essentially just West Point cadets all the time. The only problem with that is that the West Point cadets don't actually make any money, so Benny decides he's gonna give everybody a year-long tab and he's willing to let them pay off their tab in barter. And the only thing he's not willing to accept is West Point military uniforms. He accepts everything else, including their shoes. Okay, okay. if you're not picking up what I'm putting down, I'm trying to tell you that a grizzled veteran from the War of 1812 has opened up a bar right outside of West Point, and all the cadets can go there, get drunk, and pay for it with shit that they've stolen. I mean, strategically transferred to his location. <laughs> so obviously all the cadets love this guy. He's probably the most influential bartender in American history. Okay. Any big military name from that era that went through West Point was friends with Benny Haven. Nice. Ulysses S. Grant homeboys even edgar Allan poe is quoted as saying that benny was the only congenial soul in that godforsaken place nice hold on a second one second okay there we go so that's the deal that's where everybody goes to drink and get their alcohol it's from benny haven you know what that's my mother give me a few minutes give me a few minutes my mama wanted to send me some christmas gifts <sighs> it's 10 40 she should be asleep parents except for the two times a year where the cadets are actually allowed to drink on campus and that is fourth of july and christmas fast Yay. forward fourth of july 1826 all the cadets are drinking on campus openly because they're allowed to because it's fourth of july and they get absolutely hammered at nice. which point they decided that they were going to perform a snake dance i have no idea what that is but apparently at the end of it they ran over picked up the commodore of west point major william worth carried him off to the barracks because they liked the guy so much they wanted to kidnap him so they could go drink with him because of this superintendent <laughs> player decides that they went too far and that there's just going to be no more drinking ever again at west point oh Fast come later on that year december 22nd 1826 it's almost christmas and for the first time since west point's inception the cadets are not going to be allowed to throw a christmas party on christmas eve and have everybody get hammered on eggnog why so not obviously they're going to do it anyways and just try not to get caught but i mean worst case scenario they do get caught what never underestimate the power of stupidity in large groups just don't do it also never underestimate military people and their ability to get drunk for no reason what's really gonna happen you'll be shot for this no nah, i don't think so more like chewed out i've been chewed out before some of the cadets sneak off and they go across the Hudson River to Martin's Tavern where they can get a better deal on buying a bunch of alcohol and their goal is to get at least half a gallon of whiskey for the eggnog. That being said, anything worth doing is worth overdoing, so naturally they end up with two gallons of whiskey and they get caught by the guard on the way back, a private by the name of James Dugan, and they end up bribing him with 35 cents to look the other way. Next day, December 23rd, all the cadets are still stealing food and anything else they could want for this party. While that's going on, the staff have their Christmas party at Thayer's house. It's okay. at this Christmas party that Thayer decides that he's going to be a pretty cool guy. He knows that the cadets are going to drink tomorrow, but he's just going to turn a blind eye. He's not going to increase the amount of guards or the amount of staff on duty. He's just going to look the other way. He's right. going to have the same old two officers on staff making sure everything's okay. He knows they're going to drink. They can drink. Let them think they got away with it. 
it'll be fine. So it'll that be gets fine. decided, and the next order of business is to figure out what they're going to do with the class fuck-up Jefferson Davis. Yeah, like, as in the... Oh, good God, really? president of the confederacy in the future at this point apparently he has quite the drinking problem and he's not very slick about it because he has the distinct honor of being the first student to ever be arrested for going to benny's tavern and he just got back from being hospitalized for four months because the second time he got caught at benny's tavern he tried to make a getaway and ended up falling down the 60 foot cliff on the stone stairs to get there and he's been hospitalized ever since and he just got back to class really Fast forward again december 24th dude put down the bottle Christmas Eve, day of the party. During the day, all the cadets are... And don't be an asshole. But you already were, so... What am I talking about? They're going out, they're buying all the fresh eggs, all the fresh milk from the local farmers. Some of them go over to Benny's Tavern. They end up buying an extra gallon of moonshine in case the two gallons of whiskey aren't enough. And Benny's wife, Loleta, also makes them a bunch of mutton, which they're going to take back to the barracks and heat in the middle of the night as a drinking snack while they're getting drunk on eggnog. Nice! Eggnog and mutton, which is disgusting to think about. All right, yes. fast forward a couple hours. Everybody's been released for the day. They're all hanging out at the barracks. It's nighttime. It's time to get this party started. They break out the wooden buckets. They start mixing the eggs and the milk and the booze to make their eggnog. The two officers that are in charge of everybody, Captain Ethan Hitchcock and Lieutenant William Thornton, are going to bed at like 11 midnight. That's right. when the party's really going to start. And that's pretty much exactly what happens. Hitchcock and Thornton go to bed, and then everybody else just kind of starts drinking quietly in their barracks rooms, amongst themselves, hanging out in the hall, having a good time. And naturally, as the night goes on, things get a little bit louder and a little bit louder as everybody gets drunker and drunker. And finally, at 4 a.m., Captain Hitchcock is awoken by a bunch of noise. So Captain Hitchcock gets up out of bed. He's going to go investigate, but he knows exactly what he's going to find. This right. dude's been in the army his whole life. He knows it's just a bunch of cadets drinking on Christmas Eve. It's not really that big of a deal. All he's going to do is he's going to go find the first group he can, tell them to be quiet. They're going to tell everybody else, and everything's going to be completely fine. No. So that's exactly what he does. He goes upstairs to the first of many barracks rooms. It has a bunch of cadets drinking inside of it, pokes his head in the door, and is like, hey, Shut the fuck up and go to bed. And they're like, cool, our bad. And he leaves. He goes back to his room. And that should have been the end of the entire thing. So right. Captain Hitchcock is laying in bed. Sure enough, somebody starts banging on his door. So he pops up, goes to check the door. There's nobody there. Looks down the hallway. Nobody there. That was. They started ding dong ditching this guy. Seriously. We're playing those kind of games. Weird, whatever. I'm going to go back to bed. Lays back down. Five minutes later, somebody bangs on his door again. Goes over, checks the door. Nobody's there. Looks down the hallway. Nobody's there again. Shuts the door, stomps on the ground like he's going to lay back down in bed, and waits there for like 30 seconds. Somebody bangs on the door again. He opens the door, and all he catches is the ass end of a bunch of cadets yelling, Tally Ho Hitch. Okay, now it's on. Ah! He was trying to be cool. You guys are being drunk assholes. Now there's going to be consequences. Right. So he goes upstairs. He starts kicking in doors, chewing people out, writing down people's names. He gets to one room. Two of the cadets try to hide underneath a blanket, and another guy tries to take his hat and cover up his face so he can't write his name down. The dude's <laughs> under the blanket. He's like take the blanket off quit fucking around whatever they take the blanket off he sees who they are okay cool dude with the hat won't take the hat off of his face he tries to walk past him really he ends up pushing him back into the room and he's like no take the hat off your face so i can see who you are and the dude doesn't do it so he's like take the hat off or i'm going to take the hat off for you and then he rips the hat out of the dude's hands sees who it is, writes down his name, no big deal, goes over to the next room. Now, the logical thing to do here would be to go to bed and deal with your punishment in the morning. However, since they're drunk assholes at this point in time, right. they decide that since Hitchcock actually touched one of them, that it was an attack on their honor and they needed to retaliate. So they- Never underestimate the stupidity of drunk assholes. They went and got bayonets and knives and pistols and they were going to hunt Hitchcock down and kill him. Why? Captain Hitchcock, he's making his way through the barracks. There's drunk cadets laying down in the hallway. It's a complete shit show. He makes his way into one of the bigger rooms. It has like 20 cadets inside of it, at which point he explains to them that because there's more than 12 of them, this technically constitutes as a riot and starts reading them the riot act before informing them that they're all under arrest. Then after placing all of them under arrest, he tells the cadet in charge of this like area or this room that he needs to open up all the foot lockers so he can find all the booze and get rid of it. And and that cadet is like, no thanks. And he goes and lays down on the floor and falls asleep. <laughs> At this point, fucking Jefferson Davis, the future president of the Confederacy, runs in, slams the door behind him, holding the door while looking at it, and is like, guys, hide the grog. Hitchcock's coming. And then he turns around, and Hitchcock's right there, and he's like, jackass. Oh. 
damn at this point captain hitchcock looks at jefferson davis and is like take your dumb ass to bed and he's like okay and he goes to bed and falls asleep. that's the rest of the story for him yeah captain hitchcock literally just told the future president of the confederacy that it's past his bedtime and he listened this man is the biggest gangster in the entire story let's captain go hitchcock then turns around to the 20 cadets that he was just chewing out looks at them they look at him he looks at them he looks at the guy that fell asleep on the floor not respecting his authority and he's like i have no idea what to fucking do right now so he just turns around and he leaves he walks away and while all this is going on outside the barracks there's an active duty private that's on century duty over the night and he's got a drum with him to alert everybody in case like there's a fire or somebody attacks or he uh -huh. just wants everybody to wake up he has this emergency drum and a bunch of drunk cadets come up to this poor private and are like hey give me your fucking drum set so they steal this private's drum set and just start playing it. This ends up waking up the other officer, Lieutenant Thornton, who goes to investigate what's going on. Apparently at this point, the eggnog riot, mutiny, rebellion, whatever you want to call it, it's really kicked off and the idea is spread that we're going to kill some of the West Point staff because what? Thornton is immediately stopped by a student that has a fucking sword. To which Lieutenant Thornton is like, what the fuck are you doing? Put the goddamn sword down. And the drunk cadet like grumbles something throws the sword on the ground and then falls asleep on the floor. Cut back to Captain Hitchcock, who has an angry mob of students hunting him and he has no idea. He uh. He's come up on another room of cadets that have barricaded themselves into their room and he's trying to kick the door down. And he finally, kicks the door in and one of the cadets pulls a pistol and fires and at the last second one of the other cadets hits the pistol up and the bullet hits the door frame right next to hitchcock and hitchcock is like holy shit okay things are getting out of hand it's time to go get help cut back to lieutenant thornton who just got done dealing with a bunch of drunk assholes a bunch of drunk assholes with the cadet with the sword and then he hears a gunshot and he's like what the fuck is happening right now so he goes to investigate that and merry christmas there, one of the cadets hits him in the head with a piece of firewood and knocks him unconscious so hitchcock makes his way out of the barracks he's going to find help he runs into private james overton because he was looking for him and james overton is like hey your cadets stole my drum set what the fuck to which hitchcock is like yeah well they just tried to kill me so obviously things are out of control why don't you go get the comm now when he said go get the comm he meant commodore william worth however the cadets that were off to the side overheard him and they thought he said the bomb and they took that as he was referring to the bombardiers which if you don't know west point wasn't just a college at this point it was also an active military base and right. on that base was a bunch of bombardiers or artillery men and the cadets and the artillery men absolutely fucking hated each other and had this huge rivalry and in the cadets drunken stupor they took that to mean that the artillery men were going to show up and start like shelling the barracks or at least like try to attack them somehow so they spread the word and all the drunk cadets start fortifying their barracks for an attack they're putting all the furniture in front of doors they're breaking out all the windows oh. they're loading whatever guns they have they're getting ready for an actual fight it is at this point that captain hitchcock hears the bugle playing meaning that it's time for everybody to wake up or so he thought because he turns around and realizes that a bunch of drunk cadets had stolen the bugle and we're playing it too he then Great. just kind of stands there for the next couple hours watching all the cadets fortify the building for an attack that's never coming as they break out windows ruin a bunch of furniture and then eventually they all get quiet and pass out drunk waiting for this attack to come that never actually comes so then the real bugle does actually kick i can't wait for this off and all the other people start showing up there's a couple of barracks that weren't actually involved all those cadets start showing up the rest of the staff superintendent there and everybody is like what the fuck happened there's broken glass everywhere there's mutton vomit all over the place nice. there's drunk privates out in the field with a drum set like what is happening so then captain hitchcock goes over talks to thayer explains everything that happened and he's like what do you want me to do and thayer the dude that knows everything like total hard ass he's like totally in charge even he's like <laughs> I have no idea. So they just kind of go about their day like nothing happened. And then slowly <laughs> over time, they kind of figure out, okay, well, we have to do something. So they launch a little internal investigation. Uh -huh. They figure out that there's like 90 cadets involved in this riot. And 90 is like roughly a third of all of West Point. So obviously they're not going to be able to kick out everybody. So they decide they're just going to take like the top 20 worst offenders. Uh -huh. And they're going to expel them. And like all but two of them were invited back the next year. So basically it was just a for show punishment. Some of the more notable names of people that were 
were expelled, expelled. including Hugh Mercer, who ended up being a general for the Confederacy in the Civil War. Okay. Then you had Samuel Roberts, who ended up being the Secretary of State for the Republic of Texas. You've nice. got Benjamin Humphreys, who was expelled, who ended up being also a Confederate general and the governor of Mississippi. Uh, Jefferson Davis famously didn't get a punishment at all. And then you had uh, John Campbell, who they tried to expel, but he argued his way out of it, and he went on to sit as a Supreme Court justice. Really? Life. Which, I mean, you have to admit, between a bunch of future Confederate leaders getting in trouble for a grog mutiny and a future Supreme Court justice arguing his way out of his punishment, it's some of the best examples of foreshadowing I've ever seen in my entire life. In yeah. conclusion, the moral of the story is that if you're going to do the wrong thing, do it with a lot of your buddies because they can't get all of you in trouble at the same time because teamwork makes the dream work, even yes. if the dream is to be an asshole on Christmas Eve. Thank you for watching. Best way to support the channel is go buy some merch over at thefatelectrician.com. Happy Christmas, Merry, whatever the fuck you celebrate. Quite bang. <laughs> out. I'm gonna go drink some eggnog. No, I'm not. And Laleda even makes them a bunch. I've done this. I've done I this. Keep wanting to say fucking hummus. It's not hummus. It's <laughs> what the fuck is it called? Damn it! Mutt I've... Fucking mutt. Why? Why am I getting mutt and hummus in my fucking head? I've done that too many times. I've done that way too many times. Okay. I have done that so many times. It's stunning. Okay. You guys have no idea. Sometimes you're. Sometimes you're sitting. Like sometimes you'll be sitting here and you'll be. Like, the worst for me is intros. The worst for me is intros. Because every now and again, I'll get on and I'll everything will be on. I'll be ready to go. I have everything set up. And then I start recording and my head turns into a lawnmower bag, okay? It's just a bunch of random strings of shit going everywhere, nothing connected, and I can't even speak right. You guys have no idea how many times that happens. In fact, most of my, most of the, like, I used to do, I used to do basically a blooper reel where I would just sit there and you just see me start the same video 16, 17 times. Because once you start, once you start going down that road, it's literally impossible to derail it. Okay? It's impossible to derail it. The longest I ever spent trying to get something started was like legitimately 25 minutes. And I was ready to commit homicide by the time I was able to get it right. And every single time I started up, I was like, okay, you know, the, you know, I would, I would, I would just start talking, and then my brain would just shut off. It happens, guys. Hit the like button, subscribe, leave a comment, share your drunk stories down below. I think the dumbest drunk story that I have ever had was when I started off one night in Dubai and I said, give me three shots of tequila and two Jaeger bombs. That led to a very interesting night. I'll just say it, okay? I'll just say it. I was, a hard, I was in a hard rock cafe. If you look at the hard rock cafe in Dubai, just look at pictures of that. Look at the second story of that. That's where that bottle behind me comes from, that Red Bull bottle. I actually kept that that night. It's still with me now. But... Give me three shots of tequila and two Jaeger bombs. That's how I'm starting my night. I ordered at the downstairs bar, went up to the upstairs bar. There was a there was a there was a band playing a cover like covering Evanef Evanescent songs in Dubai. It was awesome. War pugs, I'm out. There's only so, there's only so much drinking a man can do. I never got that stupid. No, I never got that stupid.